Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Impact 100 Philadelphia's spring education event, Reimagining Impact, Leaping or Creeping into Trust-Based Philanthropy. Thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. We have a solid one hour program for you tonight and we are thrilled to introduce you to our wonderful panelists who will be sharing their thoughts and experiences on this movement that we've been hearing so much about, trust-based philanthropy, what it means for them and their work. And so we're gonna get right into it. I do invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat and to use the chat to share your actions as the evening goes on. We will be monitoring that. Um, the team will be taking a look at what you all have to say as we go through the evening. So I'm going to start right now by introducing our panelists. And I'm going to start with our um, wonderful guest from the West Coast, Maria Colby Wolf, who is president and CEO of the Washington Women's Foundation. Maria, if you would take a few minutes to give us an overview of Washington Women's Foundation, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks for having me uh, here with you tonight. Uh, yes, I'm the president and CEO of Washington Women's Foundation. Washington Women's Foundation was founded in 1995, so we've been around for almost 27 years now. We've been uh, cranking out gifts for a long time. Uh, over the course of those, uh, those decades, we've given away about $20 million and climbing. We currently have about 375 members or so and they give to us both through their membership gifts and through additional donations. We do actually have other donors who are not members who donate to our, uh, to our um, organization as well. So uh, we have a staff. Our staff is five mighty amazing women and uh, they support our members uh, in education programming, in their grant making and in, uh, in collecting more funds. We grant across six different priorities. And within those priorities, we have three big buckets of grants. We have our collective grants, which is the most typical, that's our bulk of our dollars. We have an advocacy grants and we have women and girls grants. So those granting cycles happen throughout the year in six different priorities. And those priorities are uh, law, justice and incarceration, housing and hunger, art and community culture, healthcare, climate and agricultural justice and education. We do three priorities per year across all of those different grant buckets. I think that's about it. People have other questions, they're welcome to go on our website and find out more. Thank you, Maria. Solving all the problems over there on Washington. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to turn our attention to Kendra Vanderwater, who's co-founder of Youth Empowerment for Advancement Hangout. Um, Kendra was a recipient of, um, and her organization was a recipient of, an or of a grant from Impact 100 last year. We're thrilled to have her here as the grant recipient perspective, as well as just a powerful voice in our nonprofit community. Kendra, you want to tell us a little bit about your work? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendra Vandewater. I'm the executive director of EF Philly for short, Youth Empowerment for Advancement Hangout. <laughs> we are pretty new. We started in 2019 and what we do is we work with young people. We focus on West and Southwest Philadelphia, ages 15 to 24, on young people who have been impacted by violence. So our organization is broken up into different program components, but overall we prioritize young people in the legal system, those who have violent charges against them, and we uplift the Black youth experience and basically give them all those types of support that they need. So different program components include our violent crime initiative where people receive court support, legal support, economic support, and helping them advocate for themselves and also get them out of the legal system. We have a skills and job program to where we want young people to be able to learn sustainable skills. So we don't want them to keep working at places like Amazon and FedEx. We want them to be able to learn skills where they can build careers and earn real money. Um, we also have a civic engagement and community investment component, which is where Impact 100 comes in with our grant, but we invest directly in our communities. We give out thousands of pounds of pet food, groceries every other week. Um, we make sure our young people are connecting our direct practice to policy work. So we do things like write bills to be introduced by our legislators at the state level, at the local level. And what we do is just make sure we connect violence to things like poverty and the social determinants of health. So we are big on investment. 
we do a lot of things. Our space, you may hear young people in the background. I'm trying to lock myself in my office. But what we do here is have young people go to different groups, whether they want to hang out, whether they want to see a therapist, whether they want to see um, a tutor, they're able to come to this space, be able to express themselves freely and do things like conflict resolution training, where we know that young people should be building their problem solving skills, should be using these skills in schools, in their neighborhoods. And overall, we just want young people to have the lives that they deserve. Thank you, Kendra. And your mission is really addressing the issues that you described at all of these different and powerful levels. Thank you for sharing that with us. Finally, this evening on our panel, we have Mary Broach, who will be offering Impact 100 Philadelphia Perspective. Mary is a co-founder of our organization and also oversaw the pilot of our community awards program last year, which was our pilot trust-based philanthropy initiative. Mary, go ahead and give an overview of Impact 100 and our grant making work. Thank you, Kim. And it's a pleasure to be with everybody tonight. Um, so great to have a lot of members with us, as well as people from the nonprofit community and others interested in impact. So we're thrilled to have you. Um, just a little overview uh, for context. We were founded in 2008. Um, my co-founder, Beth Dolly, first heard about the impact model in Cincinnati, and she's the reason it even exists here in Philly today. Um, as you see our goals, we pool women's donations into large collective grants. We support underserved and under, underfunded nonprofit organizations, issues and communities. And um, just a little bit about our membership. We are open to all women age 21 or older. It's membership is just a one year commitment and you join by giving $1,150 or 575 for women who are age 35 and younger. Our current membership right now made their donation by November 15th of last year. Um, and their funds are what are supporting the grants we're going to award very soon in early June um, at our annual meeting. So we, um, it's important to note that members choose how much they want to be involved. Uh, more than half of our members want to invest in the grants and um, want to be part of that, but don't have the time to volunteer or maybe put their volunteer hours with other organizations. Um, and about half of our members want to be involved in hands-on review uh, in our focus area committees and participate in events and leadership. And so it's that mix and that balance of our membership's involvement that really always works out. Um, and every single member is just crucial to the funding we provide. So this year's totals, 454 members and $435,000 in funding are record highs, um, which is just phenomenal this year when it's needed so desperately in the community. Our all-time funding is four and a half million um, to date. And then our grant structure, uh, we award, our, our signature program is our core mission grants of $100,000. Uh, that's an application process. We get about 200 applications every year. Those are reviewed by our members in our focus areas. Um, those volunteers select finalists who then are presented to the full membership for a vote. And the member vote is what determines the grant amounts, which are this year, three grants of $100,000 and two grants of 50. And then the bottom line there, the awards, community awards is what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Um, this year, we're giving one award of 15,000 and two awards of 10. And then I have one other quick slide. Uh, thanks. So just really quickly, I thought this might be helpful for context. This is our journey toward trust-based philanthropy for Impact 100 Philadelphia. We started in 2017, really significant shift for our organization from restricted project grants to unrestricted core mission. Um, then, as I mentioned, community awards, that was piloted last year in 2020-21 and is in a second year of the pilot this year. And that's a no application um, program that I'll talk much more about. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention in the fall of this year, we had a concerted effort to streamline and have here universalize our applications, um, make them uh, easier and quicker to fill out, but still provide the information that we need for our um, detailed review. And that was following a movement called Fix the Form, which is um, a trend in philanthropy right now is really useful based on feedback from 2,500 nonprofit organizations. So it just gave us really good guidance for those changes. And I think that's it, Kim, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, ma'am. 
So it felt important before we get too far into our conversation with our fantastic panelists this evening, just to define what it is that we mean by trust-based philanthropy. And so we're gonna get a slide up here that will show you um, a graphic that actually we pulled from our friends at the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project and a new document that they've released called Trust-Based Philanthropy in 4D. Um, and so when we, you know, what are we talking about here? When we talk about philanthropy, we're talking about promoting the welfare of others through private donations to charitable causes. Or as my, my friend Kat Rosquetta at the Center for High Impact Philanthropy always says, it's private action for public good. Um, but what we know about philanthropy is that there is an inherent sort of set of power dynamics um, there that really privilege the grantor and less the grantee. And so this movement of to trust-based philanthropy is really intended to address the inherent power imbalances between funders and nonprofits that exist in this structure. And at its core, really, and you'll see this quote, um, trust-based philanthropy is rooted in a set of values, right? And that's our picture there in the middle. It's a set of values that help advance equity, shift power, and build mutually accountable relationships. And once as an organization, as a funder, as a recipient of grants, you have those kinds of values at your center, the funder can then say, what are the ways in which we can act on those values? And that's what those four sort of pedals are. Our culture, our structures, our practices, and our leadership are all ways that we can walk those values to guide those dimensions of our work to be more trust-based. Um, the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project has also proposed a set of six particular principles that you might have seen, which we're going to focus on less this evening, um, because you're going to hear from our panelists about the specific principles that their work has um, institutionalized and embedded in, um, to, to advance the concepts that you see here in front of you. I want to just take a moment to note that the Whitman Institute sort of takes responsibility for this as a concept from 2014. Um, and I think those of us in the field and the, those of us who are sort of just... Um, interested in the concepts of philanthropy probably started to hear this a whole lot as with so many other things with the onset of the pandemic and the racial unrest and um, racial justice protest of 2020. And I also wanna note that our panelists this evening are two funder panelists, Mary and Maria, are each representing collective giving groups, women's collective giving groups in particular. And I think there are lots of ways in which the lessons that they're going to share and the ideas that they're going to share um, are universally applicable across funders, but there's probably also ways in which it's specific to the collective giving model. And so I just wanted to set that up as a context for this evening as well. So let's get into it. What actions have you taken towards trust-based philanthropy? Maria, I wanna talk, I wanna start with you. If you could share a little bit about how you and the Washington Women's Foundation define trust-based philanthropy as a grant maker and the specific actions that you've taken in recent years to advance those concepts. Sure. Trust-based philanthropy for us is very much what the name implies. We, um, we, we take it under, we trust that our, our, our nonprofit partners know more about what they need to do to make the world a better place than we do. Um, it really involves a lot of humility to go in and say, you know, we may be really educated, we may know a lot about a lot of things, but the folks who are on the ground working in it every day probably know more than we do. So one of the, the tenets of our trust-based philanthropy is a great deal of humility as we go forward. And in light of that, we also recognize that our nonprofit partners are doing an enormous amount of work. And so we saw those two pieces and put them into a program that we are implementing as we speak. We sort of started this process about the same time as y'all back in 2016, 17, starting to have these conversations about equity, about how is it that we can get out of our own way to try and make some change happen in this world. And uh, dove in first with the idea that we needed to do, uh, we need to ask a little less of our nonprofit partners than we were asking. So we dumped a lot this year. Uh, our process is now our, we have our LOI process. They submit a, a fairly brief LOI, those folks that are interested in, in applying to our grants. And then we do the rest of the work. So we are, our grant committee reviews those LOIs and then goes into what's called a research phase. We dumped our proposal phase altogether. And we now have our, uh, our members do the research on those nonprofit organizations. We've given trainings on how to research a nonprofit yourself, which actually for me is also a, 
a sign of our mission, which is to teach women to be better philanthropists. So learning how to research a nonprofit on your own is a really great skill to build. And so we did that this year and moved through that research phase to uh, our next phase, which is just conversations. We're not doing site visits anymore. We have conversations with those grantees that have advanced on to say, hey, tell us more about what you want us to know about your work. All of our gifts are unrestricted funding now. And we are now giving at every level. So the LOI, you submit the LOI. That's thank you for your submission. After that, if you move on to the research stage, you are guaranteed $1,500 gift. If you move on to the conversation stage, you're guaranteed a $3,000 gift. And if you're one of the um, six organizations that go up for a vote, out of which three will get three hundred thousand or get a hundred thousand dollars. Those that don't get that $100,000 gift in that stage get a $25,000 gift. So we are now giving at every single stage, respecting and honoring the labor that our nonprofits put into informing and educating us on the work that they do. So that is what we have, what we have done. And, and you know what? There's been some bumpy roads, but on the whole, it's really been an exciting process. And I know we'll talk about that more later. Um, so that's what we've done. We've really tried to improve implement that trust in our nonprofit organizations that they know how to best use the money, but it's unrestricted. It's not project-based granting. We're granting in the work that they're already doing and we grant all the way down the line. Thank you. Thank you for illuminating for us what's possible and also foreshadowing for us the challenges that the possibilities will sometimes bring. Kendra, can you talk a little bit about what trust-based philanthropy means to you as as the leader of a nonprofit and a person who is a recipient of grants, what do those words mean to you? What does it feel like to be a randomly selected grant recipient from Impact 100 Philadelphia? So for us, um, it means that we are honest with our funders, right? It is, it is about, um, like Maria had said, trusting that the nonprofit knows what they're doing. So for us, it's, if you would like to give us money, we understand that some people say, oh, you know, I wanna fund this type of project. I wanna fund education specifically. I wanna fund this. But we let our funders know that this is what our organization needs. This is what we're doing right now. And here's where we need the money. And so for us, it's how do we keep building those relationships with the funders to help them understand our work? We also invite people all the time, right? Come out to our space, see what we're doing, meet our young people we work with, see where our money goes. And then for them, a lot of times I think it's, okay, I understand more, right? And so asking us questions, that's perfectly fine. But our organization helping funders understand how we need the money, how the money is most impactful for us and our work. That's what trust-based philanthropy means to us. And as a recipient of this grant, I know that we always need money, right? So we are big on mutual aid. And so this grant for us, we pay a lot of bills for our community. We do a lot of things like giving out pet food, groceries. We're building a grocery store in our backyard right now. So that money just made it more so we could give to the community. I know last year we gave over $140,000 to paying people's bills, paying the community's traffic tickets, paying whatever they needed. And we wanna do things like that as much as possible. We believe our community needs access to things and our program can't be as impactful if we're not getting money like the community awards. And so that money has gone to our mission, our investment in our people, in our community. And so we continue to build the relationship. I love that clarity of, of boundary and, um, and stance, Kendra, that idea of here's what we do, here's our mission. We invite you to meet us here, let us show you Thank you for trusting us Absolutely. to be the experts and to be the professionals. Yeah. Mary, can you talk a little bit about Impact 100 Philadelphia's journey to these concepts of trust-based philanthropy, the things that led our board to establish the Community Awards pilot, why we chose to tip our toe into this whole pool? Sure. And I loved hearing from both of you, too. It's so great to get that extra background. Um, for Community Awards specifically, this started back in 2020 on the eve of the pandemic in February, when we were at Maria's organization's conference in Seattle. Um, it was a collective giving conference and there were a number of us, six or eight of us from Philadelphia who attended. 
Um, and we can mention the Whitman Institute, Pia Infante from the Whitman Institute spoke. I think it was the first time I had heard the term trust-based philanthropy. I think many of us were just caught, you know, unawares of that concept and loved hearing about it. And I remember during the talk, um, Pia was putting forth this idea, funders should do more of the work. We should put it on ourselves, which sounded great to me, but my first thought was how can we be fair if we do that, if we take away that open application process and do the work. So I put that question on a note card and put it up and she selected it. Um, and I was glad it was anonymous because she basically took a beat and then said, get over yourself. You're not fair. You think you're being fair. You have that application, but you're not. And we talked about it intensely, the group of us there, but of course she was right. We weren't being fair. We weren't open to smaller and newer organizations that weren't eligible for our core mission um, application. We weren't open to organizations that were so thinly staffed that you know they're out providing service all day and have no time to research funding opportunities, let alone sit down and write a proposal. Um, we're not open to people who maybe don't speak English fluently enough to do a written proposal or people who communicate better verbally or visually in other ways. So it was such an eye opener to us. It didn't diminish our feeling that our core mission program is a really important funding stream, but we were interested in looking at what more we could do. And so that summer of 2020, we'd all come through that spring, everything changing. We surveyed our members and we specifically asked to kind of put in questions about these ideas. And it was remarkable, the support that came back. It was a huge percentage of our members who said, we'd like to have our funding be more inclusive. We'd like to be open to newer and um, smaller organizations. So we felt this real validation from our members and that was the genesis of the idea. And then we just came up with this concept, which is a small committee, we have our five focus areas in our core mission application program, but for community awards, it's a, a committee of members. We have 15 people last year in the first year of the pilot, and then this year as well. I give those people a ton of credit because it's a lot of work. Um, it is, we've joked about it being this black hole, and then we talk a little bit and somebody said, well, there's a light in the black hole now. Um, it's just this world of you know 15,000 nonprofits in the Philadelphia region, You know, how do we begin to do this? But we start and we talk about issues that we think are really serious this year and should be addressed and we identify those. And then once the issues are identified, we look for specific organizations. So we're actually nearing the end of our process this year. And um, we are down to a short list of 10 organizations and we're looking at those in depth and we'll choose the three finalists to present to our members for the vote. Um, but the, I think as much as it's been just an incredible amount of work, it's been so rewarding for us, and we definitely feel like this is there's a lot of value in this move. It's how we found Kendra, and yeah, Philly. Um, we I think you were too new to apply on the other side. I have to confess, I'd never heard of your organization. Now I see you everywhere, and I'm so thrilled to know about the amazing work you do. We chose three issue areas last year, which were to address gun violence, food insecurity, and um, uh, job employment and education, adult education. And we felt like Kendra, you addressed all of them. You know, yeah, Philly was doing something in all of those spaces. So um, I think it's been a real success. We're gonna, as we always do with Impact, our members and our board need to look at it and see if we should make changes going forward. But again, tons of credit to the women who did the volunteer work and put in the effort, but also to the entire membership for being willing to go here and take this chance. And, and we're devoting $35,000 to community awards this year. So it's a small amount compared to the 400,000 on the core mission side, but it's really important money to these small organizations. Thank you, Mary. As you were talking about the metaphor of the, of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel, I was thinking about our pre-pandemic selves and if only we all knew the tunnel we were about to go through and the light that would be on the other end, right? And I, I just think that it's not an accident how neatly the metaphor you just used really marries up with, with what we've all been through and what we've learned and where we are now that we're stepping into the light um, as, a, as a grant making and as a nonprofit community or as a, as a civic society almost. I wanna do a little follow up here and talk about based on your perspective, your experience, which is different for each of the three of you, what are the immediate benefits that you've seen from trust-based philanthropy? And I'll go, I'll go the opposite way where we just came. So we'll go Mary, Kendra, and Maria. I would say just fundamentally, this is again, just my view. I think our grants are having more impact. 
I think the shift from restricted project funding to unrestricted, that core mission shift has been just an incredibly important change. We are no longer locking our applicants into a proposed $100,000 project that they might have thought of and written about 18 months, one year prior to getting the funds. When we went to make this change, as we so often do, it's kind of our organizational culture, like these ideas come up, we get input from members, and then we go out and, and talk to our grantees and our applicants to get feedback. We talked to some past grantees and hearing them say the money was really important and did a lot of good, but had it been unrestricted, they could have done even more. Or because it was unrestricted, they couldn't quite go. They wanted to switch schools in the Philadelphia School District because it changes the district. They couldn't do it. So that was all we needed to hear. We realized we'd be more effective by going that route. I feel like the same answer applies for community awards. Again, it's just a pilot, but in these two years, I think we've reached a whole other set of organizations. And through our research, we've done fairly in-depth research on about 50 of these tiny, tiny organizations that I reached out to a funder last year, we were doing, because we because there's no application, we try not to bother the candidates at all. We don't wanna you know, whip up any frenzy around this. Um, but I reached out to another funder and asked her if she knew of anything about the three candidates we were considering. And um, she, Kendra, she knew you and, and highly recommended Yeah Philly, but the other two candidates she hadn't heard of. And those I should name were Sisters Returning Home and Chester Community Coalition, who do amazing work. And they are organizations that you would not see in the paper and you won't see on other funders lists. I hope we're seeing that more now. But um, that was because of, again, stepping back and kind of flipping the script and, and doing more ourselves. Thank you. Kendra. Definitely immediate impactful. Benefit. Immediate impact is we have a list of priorities and that money can go to those priorities, right? That's one. Also, I think even receiving um, this award has given us more elevation to being in a different room with different people, right? Like as Mary said, she didn't know who we were. Um, we do get a lot of media attention, but just certain groups of people don't know us. And we're very small. Our staff is five people, we're onboarding a lot of, like next week I'm onboarding three people. So we're growing really rapidly, but I think just having the money for like general funds and priorities is the most impactful. It is direct impact and that's important for us. Thank you, Maria. Absolutely. I. This is my first job on this side of the funding line. So I want to underscore how surprise money is really, really amazing and helpful. Uh, but I would say that on this side, yes, the organizations that we're granting to, since we changed our criteria to really focus on racial and gender equity, and since we changed to this trust-based sort of uh, uh, methodology, making that proposal far, far less egregious, that has really change and you can see it in the grants that we have who gets our grants now and who 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 used to get them a lot smaller organizations much more bipoc focused much more uh scrappy and super interesting i gotta tell you some really exciting stuff happening from organizations that were not getting the kind of funds we had two different organizations that i have just fallen in love with who hadn't been able to pay their eds much more than a piddly amount in order to do the work. And they were doing amazing work. We had Sierra Sisters who was doing support for black women with breast cancer because she hadn't had any support when she'd had it. So mm -hmm. this incredible woman was doing this work out of her kitchen table, off her kitchen table. And we got her out of the kitchen table and in front of other people. And as Kendra said, our saying yes, gave them a bigger platform and she was able to be on TV and talk about other things and suddenly uh, they're really being able to grow. So I think that that, um, that visibility that large groups of women coming together and giving also seeing that organization really helps. And the other thing was, I got to say the overwhelming thanks that we received from our nonprofit partners for not having to do all the work. We had a development director, the organization had been through a lot. And uh, when we said, oh no, we're not doing written reports at the end anymore. We'll have conversations with you on the other side of uh, the granting dollars. We wanna hear what, from you what's going on, but you don't have to write anything down for us. And she said, I went home and I cried because I didn't have to write this big report. And I think, you know, that is horrifying that whatever we're doing, 
making people do reports and things like that makes people cry. Like that's terrible. We shouldn't be doing that to the people who are doing the work in our world. So, um, so that has actually been really gratifying. And, and I will say just to reiterate the research phase Having our members do the research was probably the most terrifying thing for them, but it was really rich. It taught our members that they can find information themselves. They're more than capable of finding out what they need. And in fact, they found out more information than we sometimes would have received from a proposal. So that research can actually open up your eyes to a whole host of other aspects of a nonprofit that a proposal just wasn't getting, uh, giving that richness and that robustness of information. Um, so that's been a really huge benefit. Um, and just really quickly, the third thing, we've been doing educational programming in line with our granting for the first time, like really saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna fund in school to prison pipeline, we're gonna learn about the school to prison pipeline. And we are learning that we did not know as much as we thought we did on a whole bunch of things that we've been granting in for 25 years. And that has been eye-opening, I think, for some of our members, but also very, very exciting and fun for all of us to learn more about these issues that we care about, but realize maybe we didn't know as much about them as we thought. Um, I, wanna, we, I see in the chat, we have a quick question for you, Maria, that I'm just wondering if you could address quickly, which is that, are you reaching out to nonprofits at all during the research phase? Just a quick That's yes, a no, question. and would be great. We have a very, there's a very short, we have maximum five questions. You have to do your research first. And then if you can't find certain information, you can ask the nonprofit to send it. We also told all of our nonprofits in this stage, if they had information they wanted to send us, they were welcome to do it. And some of them did and some of them did not. Or we said, you know, or point us to where we should look. So that was something else. Some of us said, go to our Facebook page. We actually do more there than we do on our, our website. So it was interesting to see the different mediums that people chose to communicate to their, their um, constituents with, but it also showed us their real work, right? Not the proposal work, it was all fluffy. And as a former development director, I wrote a lot of those proposals. I know how fluffy they were. And what was on the website and what we did on our Facebook and our Twitter, far more real and far more about our conversations that we were having with our, our, our clients than with, than with our donors. We, unlike Kendra, often we're not as honest as possibly we needed to be. The trust was not either direction, right? So this is, this opens up that possibility. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to pivot to this challenge question and I'm going to, I'm going to send this question to you, Mary and Maria first, and then I want Kendra and you to be poised to respond. Um, so Mary and Maria, how are you balancing the tensions between the concepts of trust-based philanthropy and that old chestnut in philanthropy, we have to be good stewards of the money? Should I jump in, Maria? <laughs> um, then go for it. I don't actually see it as a tension. Um, and I, I know that it, it's not obvious to people, but once you kind of get rolling down the path, and Maria, I was a, a managing director of a small nonprofit and did all development for 10 years too. So all three of us here have experience with fundraising. And there, you try to be authentic, you try to be honest, but in the old days, there was no operating money. So you always built these project budgets that had 10% of the ED's time, all this stuff that was jumping through hoops to meet these criteria that didn't really in the end mean anything. So I think now with us giving unrestricted money, um, at the big level for core mission and smaller level for community awards and opening that door for more honesty and more flexibility and control on the part of the recipient organization, which is key because they are the experts. They know if there's an issue that comes up that for Kendra would be the most important thing to deal with next week. We don't want our money to be tied up in some way when you could use it for, to address that. You know what, you, what will have the most impact. And we're all about having the most impact. So I think Getting out of the way, getting these restrictions out of the way is really key. The underlying um, principle for us within impact is really pretty serious due diligence. So on the core mission side, they're big grants. We have a financial review panel of amazing women who are incredibly dedicated to sussing out the risk factors that might be there, um, you know, good governance, factors that we all wanna make sure are there for a grant of that size. Um, they get a lot of submissions from the organization, also do some research on their own. For community awards, because they're smaller amounts, 
we dig around a lot and the information is a little bit old, but you can find out so much from an IRS form 990 um, on GuideStar. And a lot of organizations now will have their audits or an annual report on their website. You can just figure out kind of trending up or down, you know, is there an active board? There's a lot that we can figure out. And if we can't figure it out, the small organization does not move forward for community awards. We're being, you know, really careful because it is our members' money. And um, as much as our members are open to going in this direction, we want to make sure we're as prudent as we can be. Maria, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, so we took a little bit different tack than that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. We, I had emails from members who said, you're being foolish and profligate. And I was like, that's too bad. We're doing it this way. And this is the reason that we did it this way. We said, you know what? A lot of the dollars that have been built up by wealthy people in the United States of America are built up on the backs of people that we are now trying to do something about but with our nonprofit organizations. So we're trying to get our heads around the idea that maybe it's not our money in the first place. So that's one of the things we're sort of thinking about very seriously. And we're thinking about very seriously the fact that these dollars belong in the community, right? They belong here. We're not giving back to them. We're giving it to people because that's where it belongs. You know, we're trying to make change happen. We're not doing this so that we can feel better. We're doing this so that change can happen. So we're looking for change and we're looking for those organizations that are making changes happen. And the other thing that I will say is that when we started these conversations, this was a big concern. The concern that we were being foolish, that we were being seen as naive and silly. All of those things were said to me about not having reporting at the end and not having a proposal. And once I, we did the whole 990, I did a whole demonstration on how much you can actually dig out of a 990, which surprised a lot of our members. So there was the learning about how nonprofits actually function and how much information you can actually get. So that was sort of the first thing. And um, the second thing was having those conversations punched a hole through the idea you couldn't trust people. Relationship building is critical to trust-based philanthropy and you can't have a trust-based philanthropic experience if you're not talking to anybody. And so one of the things that we did on the other side, our reporting side, our grantee engagement team sits down. It used to be called the impact assessment team, right? We assessed whether or not the dollars are being used in the correct fashion as we so deemed. Now it's called the grantee engagement team and their role is building a relationship with our grantees, finding out what else we can do besides the money to support the work that they're doing that we believe in and just hearing from them how things are going. Having those conversations lanced so much of the fear around, can I trust them? And I thought that was interesting because so often for, for so many years, we've talked about the fact that we have these relationships with our grantees, but it was all kind of on paper. And so having these relationships, people to people, person to person, helps that trust a lot. And yeah, knowing how to read a 990. So it's sort of, you can do both. It's not that you're just throwing you know darts at a wall and granting to whoever walks in the door. You certainly still have to have some diligence and make sure that this organization isn't gonna um, like not be terrific. But we even talked about whether or not, if an organization folds in a year after you've given them $100,000, does that matter? For a year, maybe they stayed open for an extra year doing the amazing work that you believed in for one more year and that mattered. And finally, we finally had to also take a look at what $100,000 actually means. In the city of Seattle, $100,000 does not go very far at all. It is one employee and their health benefits for a year. So taking some good hard look at just how much money is $100,000 is another thing that we've had to kind of wrestle with. And one of the reasons we're talking right now about how do we raise more funds? Because if we really want to make an impact, we're going to have to do it. So that's one of the things that we've also been wrestling with, just how much money are we really talking about? Yeah, and come and the reality, the reality of 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 the, what you're talking about. Yeah, Kendra, I, could you reflect a little bit on what Mary and Maria just shared? Um, what do you think of that? And I think also it would be great for our audience this evening to hear a little bit from you. How do you navigate a fundraising landscape where you're not cultivating donors the same way that you might have because it's on them to do the research to find you? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. They both said a lot too. I think that <laughs> yeah. 
those things are very real. I mean, I think about how there are, there are times when, and I think some, it doesn't have to be attention, but I think sometimes it is attention. And, but I, I believe that we have built just uh, my partner, James, who runs EF Philly with me. I think that our integrity and just our transparency has been really, really important. And being a newer organization, we like, we're working with firms now who are doing a lot of our internal things. Like we're hiring people, right? So building up the internal things and structures that we need, what does the life cycle of an employee look like? What do your raises look like? All of these things that also cost a lot of money. So I think us being transparent to a funder and saying, one, how much money is that? What is that going to get us? But also these are the things that we don't have. This is what we're working on. And yes, we wanna get there, right? And so being just very honest, when it comes to spending money too, we spend a lot of money. When, when funders ask us for certain things, we have one grant, which I say is the bane of my existence, this contract. They don't understand the work that we do. And so helping them understand, they'll send me, send our staff like a form that says, oh, you have to line item every, you know, Uber or Lyft or SEPTA card that you give to someone. And I'm saying, we spend $3,000 a month on Uber, Lyft, and SEPTA. And then they'll say, you have to write each participant's name for every Uber, Lyft, and SEPTA card. So those are the things that I'll say, we're not doing that. And if that's what you would like us to do with that money, we will move that money elsewhere and pay for it with something else. So I think being transparent is very important because a lot of times it's really, they just don't understand. And we also don't have time to do that. I'm not sitting here and writing 300 people's names for every transportation that we order for them to get them back and forth to our program or to work. And I think that's ridiculous. So I think talking about how much money really, I think that is a big one, right? Like the $100,000 really is one position. How do we raise more money? I know that right now I write all of our grants for our organization and I'm still doing the day-to-day -day things that I should not be doing. And sometimes there's a grant that doesn't get done. And I'm like, oh, well, it's due tonight. I'm not gonna get it done. Oh, well, like you just have to chalk it and say, sometimes for my mental health, I cannot get that done. So I think it's just really important and it's hard, right? But to be transparent, um, our integrity, anybody can look at our finances. We spend money on the same things. People's bills, food, transportation, like it's all of the same thing. So I'm okay with people looking at our finances because I know that it's going to all of the things we say that it's going to. But I also think that it doesn't have to be so contentious and we have to be able to trust people. It's not our money coming out of like my pocket and saying, well, I can't do this. But I think a lot of times it's that people think that people are undeserving of having money. And how do we get out of that mindset? How do we shift that narrative to once we give this money, we need to allow the experts to do what they need. So I think all of those points that Mary and Maria make, said make sense. And I'm hoping that we can continue to build and shift that narrative when it comes to philanthropy. Kendra, you're getting many yeses in the chat. You may have noticed your fellow panelists are about to nod their own heads right off. The simplicity of what you just described and the ways in which um, a grant maker's requirements seem so ridiculous when put in the terms that you just shared. Um, thank you very much for that education for all of us tonight. I wanna pivot actually and use that as a gateway into a conversation about trust-based philanthropy and diversity, equity, inclusion. TBP and DEI. Um, if we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, we know that the power dynamics um, at play here are in many ways acting out the exact issues of, of diversity, equity, inclusion that we've all been talking about in the public conversation for the past 24 months. Um, reporting obligations, obviously, as you just described, Kendra, are one of them, but there's so many others, um, so many other tools on purpose or not that grant makers have at their disposal to really sustain the power dynamics as they have existed. And 
trust-based philanthropy is a strategy for rebalancing those dynamics. So to the group, and maybe Kendra, we can start with you given that you just left us off from the last question. What elements do you see of trust-based philanthropy that can help advance our efforts for a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive approach to grant making? So I think a big thing is coming out and meeting people. I know a lot of times mm -hmm. everyone's been on Zoom for the past few years, but I think being invited to the space where people are, where they're doing the work. And even if you're just observing, I really think that is a huge part of philanthropy. And I think that that builds trust, that improves the relationship. I even think about when we hire people, I don't wanna look at your resume, right? Like I wanna know you as a person. And so I think funders should be knowing people as people. What are they like? What is it like to be at their organization? What do you feel when you walk in? These things for me are very real. Energy is real. You can tell when someone is not as authentic as you may think. There, you have feelings in your gut when something isn't right. So I think funders going out, meeting people, whether it go to lunch, do all these things, I think that is really, really important. That is a big element and that builds the trust. Maria, Mary, and, and by the way, Kendra, I'm hearing the, pe the people in the background and thinking, yep, that's, that's what's missing from Zoom is that human element sometimes. Mary or Maria, what do you have to add? Yeah, I'll just, I, Kendra, so much of what you said resonates. Um, I think the power imbalance is a real problem. And I just to kind of make fun of ourselves for a minute, I think back to our, we had our restricted project grants in the beginning, and then it was a big deal to add a line item that an applicant could say 15% of the 100,000, 15,000 was gonna go to overhead. And we felt like we were being so generous in that moment. Of course, we know that is nothing. That's not a realistic overhead percentage. We were trying to do the right thing and it was a good move, you know, a tiny baby step, but this recognition that all these expenses are crucial to running an organization and this is dividing up and parceling and reporting makes no sense. Um, I think there, the, the movement toward trust-based philanthropy is away from this other trend, which was strategic philanthropy, which was you know maybe 10 years ago, which was a notion that funders could have impact by you know, deciding what they were gonna make a difference on, where they're gonna have an impact. And once again, that was in this like box of their own thinking without being in relationship, like Kendra was saying, without understanding people on the ground. So one of the things for community awards that I think is such a good move for us is these smaller organizations, I see Kim answered in the chat, our, our budget range is up to $500,000. It's a very soft range, but we're looking for, you know, 500,000 or, or smaller generally. So that size of organization, very much like Kendra's, tends to be rooted in the community. It tends to be people who know the people they are interacting with, providing services to, and they know what's going to make a difference versus it's like polar opposite from the strategic philanthropy where you're sitting there in an academic sense doing research. You know, it's kind of ridiculous when we talk about it now. So I think just getting down to the core to the extent we can, um, getting closer to the ground and letting the people who do the work have a voice. I love the idea of participatory grant making. Um, which if people don't know is the notion that people in the community, the nonprofit organizations are actually at the decision-making table for grant making. Some foundations completely step aside and bring in organizations to sit and decide where the foundation's money goes. I love that idea. I don't see quite how that could work for us for impact because there's a lot of value on the collective giving side. I think of building philanthropy of our members coming in knowing very little possibly about the nonprofit community, very little but about giving. And I think by being part of collective giving, I can speak for myself, but I know it's true for many, we become more generous, we become more connected, that money is flowing in the right direction you know, to the people doing the work. So there's a lot of good there, um, but I just think it's something we should keep challenging ourselves about. How can we keep getting the voices in the decision-making um, of the people who really know best. I was just gonna say that one of the, everything that everyone has already said, the proximate, getting proximate with everyone is, is one of the, the best, best elements and definitely one of the things that will be the most likely to encourage diversity, equity and inclusion is 
this idea that somehow all of these philanthropists are disconnected and separate and other from the rest of the community is something that I think trust-based philanthropy finally just says, no, we're going to say that we're part of, we're all in the community together. And the only way that we get to realize that is when we get close to one another as people and in relationship. And that is how we will develop those, break down those barriers. I think that inclusion is critical to, to finally breaking down those barriers. And we can't do it if we are still saying us and them, even if it's, we're the funder and you're the grantee. We can't, we have to be partners. I always, I, I put the whole relationship as, as one of a, of a car, right? Driving cross country. The, the nonprofit has to be, making the guidance. They have to be the one in control of the map and the clients and the people who are being served are the ones in control of the car. And we as funders provide the gasoline, but we don't get to sit in the front seat. And that, but we all get to go together then, right? We're not, we, and we all go in the direction that needs to be going and not necessarily a direction of somebody who doesn't actually have the map. So it's, it's, it's getting close to one another, which I think is the, the joyful part, honestly, of trust-based philanthropy. It makes philanthropy a lot more fun. A lot more fun. Relationships are fun. Road trips are fun. <laughs> well, let's look ahead to what's possible in the future. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what, what trust-based philanthropy dreams each of you might have for your organizations or for our field. Um, and that of the, the nonprofit ecosystem in which we operate. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about what kinds of things you'd like to see in the future? Kendra, what if you start? What I'd like more someone can be done? to just drop a million dollars of unrestricted funds on me. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> That's what I would like. No, I think about um, the fundraising. Like I think about now, so technically I forgot that it was, our budget had to be up to 500,000. And since last year, our budget is about 1.4 million now. And I'm thinking about how much more money we could have raised if we as leaders are not still doing the day-to-day -day thing. So I think even just creating a space for nonprofits, for the leaders, like a healing space for, for funding, for relationship building, for healing, because I think a lot of times there's really not a space for us. Um, but yes, I would like the billionaires to give us all their money. Um, I know that we invite, um, there are people with very deep pockets who do give us some money and they come here and they talk to young people and they're on GPS and ankle monitors and they're like, what is going on? And they're having conversations with them and then they leave and they're like, I really, uh, I understand this better now. Like I had, I had this perspective and now you help me see it in a different way. So I think just, Long term, of course, I think more more people pulling private money. I really do think that foundations have stepped up a lot, you know, during COVID, since COVID. I know we tend to go for more foundation money just because the way we spend our money, we need it to be unrestricted because a lot of people, a lot of government funds, we cannot spend money that way. They say, oh, you can't buy gift cards for people. You can't do like these things. This is what young people need. This is what our neighborhoods need. So I think long-term pulling together, I think Impact 100, that model, I think that's awesome. How many people have that same type of model, right? How many people are pulling money from members versus being a family foundation? So I think that would be great. And I think putting people like us in these spaces, we are very small. We do not know everyone, but we would love to keep being in these spaces, continue to educate, continue to build this relationship. It's almost like you're describing collective impact giving, right? Which is like the multi-funder version of what Mary just described with, with strategic grant making. But the critical difference there is listening to the organizations doing the work versus reading the think tank piece and coming up with a plan and a strategy on your own funders and then shifting all your grant making guidelines to meet that. Absolutely. It might look similar, but the way you get there is so different, so different. Mary, Maria, what small thing, if you could, one, employ in the next 12 months within your organizations to bring, your, to bring you closer to your vision of trust-based philanthropy? Um, I think we're really looking 
we're starting an advocacy grant, but I'd like to see us take that even further and say, you know, if we're really serious about these issues, we're going to have to do a little bit more risk taking out there in the civic world. And so one of the things that I'm interested in doing is seeing if we can start partnering with our with those nonprofits that are doing advocacy work and getting the message out for like, what legislation are you working on that would help your issue get solved on a bigger scale than what you can do in your neighborhood. And so having those conversations with our, with our members about what I'm calling it is putting your mouth where your money is, that we've gotten real good at writing a check and it's harder to actually stand up and say, you know what, and also I think that we need a policy around this that is going to be more far reaching. If we really care about the school to prison pipeline, we can't just pretend that our charity is gonna do all the work. It's just not. So we have to get a little even change. closer, even closer to those issues that we say we want to change so that change can actually happen. So that's what I'm thinking this next year, we're gonna talk a lot about advocacy work. Does that nail this down in a way that it won't, we won't move on to the next trendy thing to you? Do you, do you know what I mean? I mean, how do we keep trust-based philanthropy centered? Is, is advocacy a step toward that? I think it's part and parcel of. I think there's always gonna be the need for direct, well, not, hopefully not always, but direct services are always critical, right? Mm -hmm. People need to eat, <laughs> you gotta feed people. But we also got to figure out why it is that in America people are hungry. And so that that need to deal with with the both and is necessary. The 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 question is the answer is rarely either or, right? And and so I think the advocacy arm of work and the direct services charitable philanthropic line of work, they have to sort of come together, little pinchers, right, to get around the problem and really start seeing these problems as more holistic than I think charitable organizations have been able to do. And I think, yeah, getting together with other funders and seeing if we can all get our arms around one big issue might be an interesting way to go forward. I'm doing a lot of partnering with other collective granting organizations in the area with education. And what else are we interested in learning about and thinking about and what else are we interested in, 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 in giving in? And can we pool some of our we're already pooling our collective funds as individuals. Do we need to start pooling our funds as nonprofit organizations or as foundations, excuse me, to fund uh, even bigger, more audacious projects? Um, those are the dreams, but right now we have an advocacy grant. We're just doing not, it's still unrestricted giving, but to organizations that are doing advocacy in the issues that we care about. So okay. we're doing school to prison pipeline this year as one of our, one of our funding focuses. So, we're granting a whole bunch of organizations that are working that our advocacy grant will be granting non unrestricted dollars to organizations that do advocacy work in that field. And then we have a women and girls grant that will be women and girls in the school to prison pipeline focusing on those programs. So it's, it's all of a piece and it's all over the year, but it's big bits and pieces trying to nibble at different angles of the same issue. Can I just say that I love that? I love that okay. because a lot of people come to us and are very confused that we do advocacy work and direct practice work. And I'm like, it all goes together, right? And so I think we need to shift the narrative around that too, that direct service also goes with policy because who's making the policies and they do not represent what is actually happening on the ground. And I think about the bill that we wrote to be introduced that's around birth certificates and allowing young people under 18 to access their own birth certificate. And people are like, oh, wow, I didn't know that was an issue in the state. And we're like, yes, if this actually passes, that's going to be a huge change for the thousands and thousands of young people who are 17 and cannot get their own birth certificate because they do not, they're disconnected from their family or they're in foster care or they're in some type of legal issue. So I love that. And I think it's awesome. Kendra, you had just been to Harrisburg, I think, when we talked a while ago with your um, young people advocating. Yeah, I think it's remarkable. I love the focus on advocacy. I know we're getting near the end. I'll just say really quickly, um, this is really down in the weeds, but I would love to see us stream continue to streamline our application process on our core mission side. I think 
a, a way to have more impact is to have less of a drain, <laughs> be less of a drain on the nonprofit community, make it as seamless as we can. We've been working on it. I think we have a ways we can go with that. And then just because you inspired me, Kendra, with the idea of the million dollars <laughs> coming down on you, I would love to see our membership grow. And I know it's a self-serving comment, but I'm sure Maria would say the same thing. We think, based on a survey of our members, that it's conservative to say Impact 100 Philadelphia has added $3 million to the nonprofit community in new money because our members give more when they join Impact. They don't trade off donations, they give more. I think that's true for collective giving across the country. If we can have more members to support more organizations like yours, that's another difference. Um, so I'll end on that note, but I, I just loved hearing all the points y'all raised. What a beautiful place to end collective giving as a way of addressing all kinds of things we want to address in our community because come one come all you are welcome, please be part of the work. Um, it is now my task to say thank you to our panelists, thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. Um, this has been such an illuminating 59 minutes and we are so grateful and indebted to you for that for sharing your wisdom and and just just general brilliance and. I personally feel incredibly inspired. Let's go forward and do good work. It is now my task to do a quick commercial for the Impact 100 annual meeting. Um, this is a message from our, our membership committee, but also for on behalf of all members of Impact 100, I wanted to let you know and remind you that we do have our annual meeting this January, or January, mm -mm, June 6th. Uh, we will be in a fantastic new venue this year, Craft Hall. We are looking to maximize the number of current members and guests who attend. Um, everyone say a quick prayer that all variants will be passed at that point. It is a great way to introduce prospective members to Impact 100 as well as to connect with your, your friends and colleagues um, who have been members and are members. Um, we are making it possible for you to bring a friend for free if you renew your membership before May 20th. This includes those of you who use our installment option. And if you re renew by May 20th, your name will go into a, a raffle for a variety of fantastic prizes. I can't even begin to tell you how incredible our members are being at finding fun prizes donated specifically for this event. If you do not renew by May 20th, you can still bring a guest, but that person would be charged $25. So that's incentive to renew early times two. Um, and you would automatically be registered for the raffle. Please, please, please come meet our grantees, find out who won which grants, enjoy meeting other members, enjoy getting to see your friends um, that you haven't seen in person in more than two years, listen to live entertainment of some past grantees. It's gonna be a wonderful celebration, culmination of our work this year. We can't wait to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please join us on June 6th. Be safe, everyone. I joked to my kids, I was gonna say, leave the meeting safely in the same way you would say drive home safely. They didn't think that was funny, but I'm gonna say it anyway, leave the meeting safely, but please do before you go, feel free to put us all on gallery view to say good night, give a quick wave to everyone um, before you go back to your regular lives. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>